She is a CAR director and a real estate agent um, with West Shores Realty. She is also a CIPS. Next, we have Lillian Wing. <laughs> she is a global committee, of course, a CIPS and a realtor with KW. Next up, we have Sabina Birkenfeld, and she is an amazing CIPS realtor with Engel & Volkers. Next, we have Ben Larson. He is owner-broker with Engel & Volkers and CIPS. Uh, after Ben, we have Suzanne Karn, and she is a CAR director and a realtor with um, South Bay Coast Realty. <laughs> yes. And finally, we have our, <laughs> our awesome David Potter. He is our 2023 president here at the South Bay Association of Realtors and of oh, CIPS and Realtor um, King Harbor Realty. All right. <laughs> so give it up for our wonderful board. Oh, and I'm sorry, Maeve, behind us. <laughs> sorry, Maeve. So we also have Maeve um, making us very, very global. She is calling in from Portugal. So she is an amazing um, California and Portugal specialist with Keller Williams as well. <laughs> All right, so we'll get us started. Um, Claudia, we'll just get us started off with the letter A. Letter A. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome. On behalf of our global committee, it's an honor and a privilege to have you guys here um, and educate you with uh, what Global has to offer. So I will start with uh, what is uh, the letter A, which is a global ambassador. I cut out a little piece I'm going to read to you under uh, the National Association of Realtors. What is a global ambassador? Global ambassadors, also known as GAs, are U.S.-based realtors appointed by the NAR president to serve as NAR's ambassadors to real estate professionals and organizations in their assigned global countries. They help maintain NAR's relationships with its bilateral partners in these countries. Appointees are local or state realtors. Associations and have some knowledge of real estate practice culture and language of at least one of their assigned countries and appointments. They're also made each year a prior, prior to the NAR Annex, the Realtor Experience Conference and run concurrent to the NAR presidential term with the term beginning at the conclusion of the conference. For the list of current global member ambassadors, uh, we have very, very many. I, uh, it's a long list, but uh, we have representatives from all over the country. So GA served for a one-term year. However, in many cases, it takes longer than one year to develop significant working relationships with international partners. With this in mind, consideration will be given to reappoint where such action will strengthen and intensify relationships. In most cases, GAs will not serve for more than a four, four terms. So if anyone has any questions in regarding on um, how to become a global ambassador, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. So I have B, which is for Bitcoin, but I'm really going to cover cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrency, you're all familiar with it. It's an alternative to traditional payment methods. It can be used for international trade and cross-border transactions. The cryptocurrency itself is not regulated by any central bank or government, which means that it's not tied to any country's economy. Cryptocurrency has become a popular form of payment throughout the world. More than 70% of Americans have heard of Bitcoin and the underlying technology blockchain. Many countries have legalized the use of cryptocurrency, such as Canada, Mexico, Israel, Brazil, Australia, India, India, all EU countries, Japan, Singapore, the UAE, and many other countries. Some countries still don't allow cryptocurrency, like China, due to the fact that they can't track it and trace it and know where the money's being going. going. And probably some people have a tendency to use it not to pay taxes, but that's still a good thing. <coughs> Cryptocurrency relating to global real estate has been becoming more popular and commonplace. Currently, real estate transactions are being conducted in Bitcoin in the U.S. and other countries all over the world. An, an advantage of using cryptocurrency is that there is no need for currency exchange. They do not require a conversion process at all. The exchange process is instantaneous, and there's no delays compared to going through a bank or using mm. cryptocurrency, a, a currency exchange company. And a lot of um, title companies are starting to allow the use of cryptocurrency. Typically, you have to deposit the funds and convert it and then put it into um, title and escrow. 
that being said, you guys probably wanted the challenges of cryptocurrency. Um, there's four, you know, some people are concerned about it, some people aren't. People have bought cars with cryptocurrency, paid off loans, you know, done business internationally. Cryptocurrency can be extremely volatile in the investment as we've seen over the past year. Fluctuations can occur suddenly and can be based on internet news. Strong international currencies do not have the same sensitivity to this. Cryptocurrency is relatively new and have not proven themselves over the long term as an investment. Cryptocurrency has scalability issues. Blockchain has certain capacity limitations. Crypto, <coughs> crypto newbies are vulnerable to security risks, such as if you lose your private key to unlock your account, you're out of luck. No one else has it. There's no way, way to unlock it. And counts, certain crypto accounts are subject to phishing and other attempts to gain control by malicious, malicious means. So protect your key and be careful with your account. And now we have C, which is Claudia. C for Claudia. Okay, so the letter C. Uh, so we were speaking regarding to the CIPS designation. Uh, many people ask, what is CIPS and how do you obtain? The CIPS is uh, it, the certified, it's abbreviated for Certified International Property Specialist. So the Certified Property Internationally, International Specialist designation is for realtors from the United States and abroad, as well as association staff and volunteer leaders who wish to develop or grow their international real estate business. It will provide you with the knowledge, research, network, and tools to globalize your business. By earning your CIPS designation, you will gain access to the CIPS network, which is compromised of over 3,500 real estate professionals in 45 countries. This member-only group is specifically for a real estate practitioner of the National Association of Realtors who has earned the CIPS designation. Realtors who have earned this designation's this designation are consumer's best and most trusted resource for navigating the global market. How to obtain it or what will you gain? So you obtain marketing tools such as listing in the finds a CIPS online directory, cust customizable, uh, uh, customable, oh, okay, uh, pre-printed postcards with the logo, <laughs> pre-printed web banner ads, and uh, pre-printed press release, t press and release. So it's pretty much uh, everything's already ready for you to put your beautiful face and the areas that you are ready to market in. And that's, that's knowing the dual language, right? Sometimes we get tongue, tongue twisted, excuse me. So um, other, other tips and techniques are like global perspectives, print newsletter, the networking where you have access to all CIPS members only communities, <coughs> invitations to exclusive events at NAR meetings, ref referral contract forms, and how do you earn the education? You complete two core courses of local markets, transaction tools, and then you complete three electives, and you could choose from Americas, Europe, Asia, Pacific, at a home with diversity, and we also have one um, as a second home. That's a new one uh, that also counts as an elective. I strongly uh, do encourage, if you decide to do it, try to do it in another state, and maybe in another country while you're doing a, um, maybe a, a trade mission somewhere because you're able to learn and network with other realtors from across the world. I took mine, um, I started I started in another state, but then COVID occurred, so we had to do it via Zoom. I figured, let's put it off because I was we were hoping, right, COVID was temporarily, but at the end I figured, okay, it's time to get it done, but I know that you will gain more exposure and more benefit when you, you go out there and you do it in another state and you come back with many, many built relationships and connections. If anyone needs information, feel free to reach out Claudia with a C, C-I-P-S. It's also cheaper in other states. Oh yeah. And it's also cheaper. <laughs> yes. So we are on to the letter D. Okay. D is for Deutschland, which means Germany in German. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> so uh, Deutschland is a country that many people are choosing to invest in or move to according to uh, German research that has been done. And there are actually several reasons they came up with why people choose Germany. 
Um, first, it would be due to job relocation and uh, company moves to overseas there. Then the second is educational pursuits where people will study abroad and Germany is one of the favorite places to do that. And then also there uh, are humanitarian reasons as well as number four for personal or family reasons that people go back to Germany possibly after they've left there and lived abroad in other countries like the US for 30 years or you know that long and then they decide to move back for family reasons and then they either purchase in a town that they you know are familiar with or whatever so but those are the four main reasons that people will choose Deutschland Germany um, the uh, reason to like if you have clients that are inclined to move to Germany my advice to you is to pick a you know a realtor abroad in Germany because they will be of tremendous help to you. And some of the biggest companies over there are like Engel and Filkers, like we have here, uh, but they, are, they have a really, really dominant presence in Europe, uh, especially Germany, because that's where they originated and had their first office. And then uh, Remax or Sotheby's are other big companies, and they are familiar, of course, with our way of doing real estate, because in Germany it's quite different. They have, uh, the buyer usually pays the realtor. So when you have a contact or a person that you can pick overseas in Germany, they will help you like with, uh, you know, like referral fees or whatnot. They will also advise you where to invest or what if your client isn't quite sure where to go. But one of the big reasons would be uh, that they're looking for like a possibly a steady and attractive cash flow in whatever investment they make. Uh, like if it's business where they buy apartment buildings or uh, shopping centers and whatnot, people invest in those over there. Uh, so uh, it's also the infrastructure is important where people go and of course safety. So some of the big cities that are very popular right now are Berlin, Hamburg, Frankfurt, uh, Munich of course, Cologne which is like the media center in Germany for all the high tech and media over there. And then of course, you know, the cities where the German cars <laughs> are made. Those are all big uh, draws for people who try to invest <coughs> or move to Germany. So, uh, the, the government really has shown that when people, uh, after many years, uh, having lived in the US, it's a large number of people that are returning to Germany. And uh, then also, if you purchase, uh, like uh, long term, you can do rental investments too. You can purchase things uh, with just a rental income or just, you know, lease stability um, so that's another way uh, that you can make money without actually owning the land and so you know of course homes apartments and then combination units where a lot of this is where people live in one place and then they have their business right below or next door so those are some of the options that you might find that your clients might be interested in so it's just, uh, you know, you have a lot of the film industry over there. You have, uh, s they're trying to set up a real estate system like ours, but it, it hasn't happened yet. And then uh, it, it's just kind of a, a cultural thing that if you do go over with your client or you're involved in the German community there, uh, they their main meal is lunchtime, so they love a long, nice lunch, and they often they will drink during lunchtime. I brought some wine for you to taste, because that's just a cultural thing. They also like a really firm handshake when you meet someone in Germany. 
And those are just a few little tips. And if you want more, I'm happy to share that down the road. Thank you. Yes, hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. So E is for Europe. And thanks to Zoom, I'm coming to you from Europe today, from Portugal. And thanks to all the tech and tools that are now at our disposal, I've been able to continue selling real estate in California since my husband and I moved to Portugal two and a half years ago, and also been able to serve on the um, South Bay Global Committee. So that's why I'm here with you today. Um, and I'm sure for many of you, visiting Europe is probably something that's on your bucket list. Maybe because your family came from here, or maybe it's the history or the food. But Europe is also a, on a lot of Californians' radar at the moment as a place to invest, to work, and possibly to consider living, which is the decision we made a few years ago. So here are the most popular countries in Europe that Californians are moving to right now. You just heard Sabine talk about Germany, that is number one. Coming up after that is the Netherlands, a country that, like most of Europe, likes to boast about a great work-life balance, which is cool. Sweden, high standard of living in Sweden and English is used a lot in business. Um, Spain, also very popular, affordable housing, um, great food, great weather. Um, Ireland, where I come from. Um, most famous for the high-tech companies like Google and Facebook and Apple and lots of job opportunities there. And Portugal, of course, my current home. I'll be speaking more about that later. And France, that we all love for the culture and the food. And we all know Paris as a global hub for fashion and the arts, right? Um, so Western Europe is common. Is, is um, Most of us are aware of that. But there are also a lot of Eastern European countries that are gaining more popularity thanks to a surge in tourism. So there are a lot of investors at the moment that are purchasing residential real estate in the Czech Republic, in Prague, in Budapest, in Tallinn, in Estonia. Commercial investors looking at Poland and Romania and then open to everyone who's not very familiar with all the countries' different laws is the um, Real Estate Investment Trust, the, the REITs. Um, which is also an option. So if this is something that you or your clients are interested in, just go do your homework, uh, find out about the cost of living, the language barriers, the visas, etc. But if it's your dream, go for it. We did and we just love it. Thank you. On. Okay, can you hear me? Um, so, FIAPSI, uh, that's an international real estate federation which was founded in Paris in 1951. And uh, FIAPSI is a worldwide business networking organization for all professionals associated with the real estate industry. The benefits are uh, to be a part of a professional network and expand your global influence. To develop your expertise participating in the FIAPSI World Council. <coughs> then to enhance your status through educational programs and explore new opportunities to build your business and market globally. Uh, also to raise your professional profile to showcase your properties in FIAPSI National and World Prix d'Excellence Awards is another benefit. Um, so FIAPSI uh, has a location here in the United States and it's based in New York on Fifth Avenue, a very nice area. And then a US membership will include membership to the international listing platform Global Property Pros, so that's special. Uh, then I thought you'd be interested to hear what the membership costs are. Mm. Yeah, an individual membership is $595 annually, and a principal uh, and company membership 
uh, annually comes to $3,500. And that, those are um, things like, for instance, our South Bay Board of Realtors, um, the uh, like CAR, um, the CCIM designations, uh, a lot of the professional big things that are offered to us uh, are uh, in that principal and company membership. Then they have some special deals for those of you who are 35 and under, <laughs> which uh, then lowers the yearly uh, annual, the annual cost to $289. There's also a special student membership, which is the lowest, and again, that is uh, also for those 35 and under, uh, and that's only $195 a year. But that has several requirements and that they're studying in a FIAPSI uh, type academy or taking school, and it has to all be verified to get that low price annually. So that may be something that you might want to look into, uh, just like with the CIPS, because it will help you on a worldwide level and it gets you to travel and network with wonderful people all over the world. Thank you. <coughs> And I have G. G is for Global Communications. Um, when I said I have a 16-month-old, so I feel like I'm always doing the ABCs now. C for G. Anyway, so we're talking about Global Communications. For those who's not familiar, in the U.S., texting is really big. We text all the time. And um, WhatsApp, some people use it here in the U.S. But out in Asia, I would say, at least the parts where I'm from, I'm from Taiwan, and I frequent um, China, Japan. Anyway, those countries. Texting is less of a big thing, and we all use messaging apps. And so for those of you who may have heard, there's WhatsApp, there's WeChat, there's Line, there's Kakao. And it seems like each region kind of has its own. Uh, Kakao is primarily for Korea. J um, Japan, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, I think they all use Line. And then in, in China, they actually block all of those, um, and they use WeChat. And WeChat is one I was going to highlight a little bit more. I actually just got back from Shanghai. and. It's like, a, it's not just a messaging system, but um, a lot of these also incorporate social media. So like Line has that too, um, where you can do posts and everything. And so a lot of people, for example, a lot of my friends overseas, they don't necessarily post to Facebook or Instagram, but they post to their Line and WeChats. So I know that a lot of real estate agents who are focused on those markets or those clients tend to um, post on those um, platforms. Now in China, when I came back, or when I went to Shanghai, I realized WeChat is not only again, for social media and for messaging, but also you can call a cab from it, you can pay for all your shopping from it, you can shop online with it, and then when I traveled into China, even before you get into the country at the immigration, um, you know, we all have to fill out COVID questionnaire. This is the same in every country. But there, you actually have to scan your WeChat account, answer the questions through your WeChat account, and then you can enter the country. Um, my family and I were laughing because um, China really is really good at monitoring every single person who goes in and monitoring exactly where you go, because I'm pretty sure there's GPS on there too. Um, so anyway, while you're traveling, um, while I'm talking about global communications, I also wanted to add um, a thing that I discovered this trip, which was really helpful, is a lot of people who travel, they um, use roaming, and obviously the charges add up. And then a lot of people, what they do is they get local SIM cards, so you can use the local internet. Um, but for me, this time, because I was traveling between three countries, it was kind of a pain to get three different cell phones. Um, and so I found this, it's kind of like a hub where it's an internet hub and you can actually just hook onto it and travel in all countries using the same account. You just pay per day. So I found that for those who are traveling and have any questions, you can ask me about it later. Um, I found it super duper helpful um, to do that. Uh, it seems weird to, we, we're discussing as a committee, it seems weird to talk about global communications and not mention chat GBT. Um, I'm sure some of you guys are using it now. Um, if there are new agents in here, it's going to be like your new best friend. As we all know, when you start out as a new agent, it's fake it till you make it, even though on topics you don't know. And chat GPT, I'm, every time I've looked at something on there, it seemed pretty spot on. Um, so I think the possibilities are endless, whether it's lead generating, listing descriptions, learn about a, another city abroad, global real estate laws, um, writing something in another language, terminology in another language. I think um, the possibilities are endless. So that's Hi, so uh, leading in from uh, what Lillian just mentioned, I got a little uh, 
uh, ChatGPT helped in putting this thing together. So that's where actually some of this information is coming from, since I haven't been able to travel um, lately. Okay, so I have H for hospitals and medical tourism. So as travel becomes easier once again, medical tourism is rebounding post-lockdown. In 2023, these eight destinations are the most visited by medical tourists. Turkey, India, South Korea, Germany, Switzerland, Mexico, Singapore. And one that's not on the list is Panama, where we actually have a Mayo Clinic, which probably I didn't know until I took the CIPS class and our, um, our trainer kind of informed me of or uh, shared that information with us. Some, are, um, some of um, these medical tourists are also heading to Switzerland and India and Thailand, where they are leading the way for um, medical-based wellness programs, while others are heading towards China, where there's the emergency key destination for those seeking stem cell therapy. So this is a new game in a lot of ways. Um, medical tourism is motivating people to travel to foreign countries for medical treatment. Most of these tourists are seeking elective treatments such as basic medical, dental, I'm one, I just went over the border last year, uh, cosmetic, elective, and prescribed surgeries such as hip replacements and, um, and cancer care, cancer uh, uh, therapies. So what's the main driver, uh, you might ask? It's cost savings. It's obvious, right? Cost savings for medical treatment. For example, and this is a big one, hopefully none of you are gonna need this, my mom did, a coronary bypass performed in the United States now costs, if it's kind of a minor, cab, uh, what they call a cabbage, it's uh, 70 grand and it can go all the way up to 200,000. But um, depending upon um, the same procedure in a certified state-of-the-art hospital facility in Singapore, the cost is around $18,000. That's just to give you an example of like a major operation, but almost anything we can consider, like brow lifts or uh, you know, hair transplants and all of that, we're talking about low thousands compared to what we'd probably play in America. By the year 2020, the global medical tourism market size is expected to reach $98 billion, which means this is a new trend and it will probably be uh, something that, that is very common. In fact, over the weekend, I happened to be listening to um, a um, current candidate for presidency who's recently gone to Japan to have a surgery on his throat. So everybody's doing it, even a few members on this panel, parents from what I've been told. So how does it relate to global realtors, whether you do commercial, residential, or are working with an investor when considering medical, and when you're considering a medical destination. So here's a couple of ideas you might think about. You might, you might purchase a condo or a townhouse. Maybe you have a client who might be interested and rent it out and, and use it for your medical treatment, but then you can also uh, rent it out for other people who may be coming in for a treatment so it becomes a working asset. If you're doing commercial, you might consider, or if you're considering doing per, um, commercial, you might consider to repurpose and convert properties such as abandoned hotels, failed clinics, or what about this idea? Maybe um, a small rural farm that um, you can create like an animal sanctuary and tie that into wellness and therapies with working with animals as people and clients heal their mind and their bodies. And the other thing you might consider, and that's how I got some of this information, like on LinkedIn, actually, was find a consultant. And I did find one. Just so you know, there's a lady named Maria Todd with a PhD who's on LinkedIn. And she's been in the field for 18, uh, for 19, uh, since 1983. And I will tell you quite honestly, I knew none of this information. I only knew like five facts on this paper up till a few days ago. This is something to, to know about and learn about. And I think it's exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. So Maeve will come back on the screen and present on the eye. Okay, back to me. Great. So I, um, we're taking a look at investing in real estate overseas. 
Um, something that certainly sounds very attractive and there are many benefits to it, but also some risks that you should keep in mind. Um, one of the most common motivations for most people is for personal use. How would you like to have a cute little cottage in the west of Ireland or a holiday home in Costa Rica that you get to use when you want it and then have potential income from renting it out when you're not using it. Um, investors, when they're looking at different countries to invest in, um, you know, Investment 101 tells us that we should diversify our portfolio, right? So what better way to add another level of diversification than to spread the risk across different countries and completely different markets. Um, high potential returns. Uh, I was talking about Eastern Europe earlier. There are so many emerging parts of the world where the potential um, the potential returns are a lot higher than they would be in developed markets. Um, and it also could act as a hedge against the current market if you've got inflation or economic st instability here in the States, um, you might benefit from having investments in other places, right? And the main risks to look out for, the currency fluctuations can be an advantage or a huge risk depending on, on what way the dollar is going. Um, you also have to be very aware of the legal reg and the regulations of owning property in the different countries and understanding, you know, what being compliant in another country means. Excuse me. Billion six hundred twenty-four million. Sorry about that. Um, market liquidity can also be an issue. You know, we may be able to sell, sell and buy properties very quickly in California. It's not always the case. I know in inland Portugal, uh, where I am right now, many of the properties are on the market for up to two years. So it's very, it can be very different depending on where you're looking. And also with international markets, it can be more difficult to find out the information that you need to make an informed decision. So as you're doing your homework, connect with professionals in those countries, with people who know what the laws are, what the regulations are, and people who can point you in the right directions. And then it can be fun. Thank you. Thanks, me. Next, we have Jay for Japan for Lillian. Jay for Japan. I feel like I don't need a mic. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm loud. <laughs> um, I, um, I'm not Japanese, nor am I an expert on Japan, but I'm certainly one of its biggest fans, and that's of its people, its culture, its music, its food, the country itself. Um, to give you guys a little bit of a context here, I, um, I'm ethnically Taiwanese. I was born in Costa Rica and then I grew up here in Torrance until I was about 10 and then lived in Taiwan until I graduated from high school. And then here on there, um, my life is kind of straddling both hemispheres and my real estate career kind of reflects that as well. Um, and I'm explaining all this because I used to go to Japan all the time and prior to my real estate life, um, I used to own a business and did a lot of business in Japan for my step years. Um, I feel like I started that business more to go to Japan all the time, you know, about the business, but um, anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about, because there's a lot of opportunities in Japan. Um, when I initially started real estate, I actually had thought, you know, Tokyo, you know, you think of the big cities, Tokyo, and whatnot, um, and I thought just like New York, San Francisco, LA, we're talking about multi-million condos. Um, I don't know if many of you guys are aware, but that's how expensive real estate is out there. However, there's actually opportunity in other cities like Fukuoka, um, other nearby smaller cities. They're still big cities, but it's actually possible to invest only about $100,000, $200,000 in a condo that you can rent out. Um, pretty good returns. And it's easier for a foreigner, that way you don't have to go get a loan and whatnot, which could be trickier for foreigners. Um, when we were talking about this topic in Japan, I was kind of looking around and I just recently discovered, um, this is going to be a surprise to them. They, didn't do this during dress rehearsal. Um, <laughs> there's a huge opportunity now all over Japan um, where the government is virtually actually giving away 8 million homes on the market for free. Um, the reason they're doing that is because Japanese, Japan's population has been shrinking a lot. And that's mainly due to the elderly passing away, people, the younger generations don't want to get married, don't want to have kids. Um, and so they also don't, and so a lot of them are inheriting these properties, but the property taxes are 1.4%, which is not small either. Um, or the younger generation want to move closer to the city, so we have these, what they call akias, that's right, um, Japanese for vacant homes. Um, out, it used to actually be more in the countryside, but now even in Tokyo and everywhere around there, um, they're actually given away. Houses are left vacant due to natural disasters, um, and they're equally difficult to get rid of because um, 
not just Japanese culture, but in Asian culture, we're a little more superstitious. And so if someone has died in the home, or there was a violent murder in the home, or an, uh, you know any, any suicides, that's another big thing, people tend to not want the home, even if they remodel it, even if they completely renovate it. And so um, to counter this growing problem, um, not only are many of these 8 million homes being put on the market for free, homeowners, some of the homeowners are actually getting incentives and paying money for people to just take over these properties. Um, so in some cases, local governments are putting up sponsor programs and things like that. Um, you would have to check and see if foreigners would qualify for it, but foreigners definitely can purchase in Japan. So that was exciting to hear about. Thanks, Lillian. <laughs> Yeah, it's super interesting. Um, <laughs> okay, so next up is the letter K, and we have this for Kiss, Bow, and Shake Hands. So has anybody like read the book before, Kiss, Bow, and Shake Hands? Familiar with it? Yeah, it's a great book. Um, so essentially it deals with a lot of cultural customs. So when we're dealing with our global counterparts, it's very helpful and important to know at least a basic understanding of cultural customs. This can really help aiding in your success in business negotiations, bridging the gap, and increasing trust between parties. Um, so if anything from greetings, punctuality, politeness, or gift giving customs, they can, these can all contribute in subtle ways to bridging communication and increasing um, receptivity between you and your global counterpart. So three countries that I'm really passionate about are France, where I used to live for some time, um, Japan, which is my heritage, and Brazil, which I've gotten to know very well over the past year. So for example, in terms of punctuality, with Brazil, it's a little bit more fluid sense of time. So being late for an appointment, it's, it's not, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, however, in France, it is advised to make an appointment in advance, like stick to your appointment time. And then, of course, in Japan, punctuality is very, very important. So it's advised to arrive on time, if not early, for the appointment. Um, being late is considered very rude. Um, in terms of greetings, if, for example, in Brazil, on a first meeting for business, it is normal to have a handshake. Um, but thereafter, or more in informal settings, you might have a kiss on the cheek or a hug. Um, and it's, very, it's a very warm culture. So maybe when you're talking to somebody, it's going to be a lot closer than maybe here in America we're used to. Um, in France, for a business meeting, it might be a brisk, light sh uh, handshake. Uh, but thereafter, maybe a air cheek, uh, air kisses on the cheek, bisou. Um, while in Japan, a, a first meeting, especially for business, would probably include a bow. Um, in terms of the bowing, so if we are lateral in terms of, let's say, Lily and I are both uh, lateral partners across the world, we might bow to the same level. Um, however, if I'm meeting with David Potter, who is the president, he's a higher level than me, I would be the one bowing much deeper than him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then just one last thing on this would be in terms of relationship building. Um, so in Brazil, it's, it's very important to make like long-term relationships. Um, so if they're dealing with XYZ real estate company and Ben, for example, the relationship's going to be more geared towards Ben rather than the company. So if the next year around Sabina comes in working with the same company, it's not going to be the same level of trust, if that makes sense. Um, in France, um, normally it's a little bit more for formal and reserved to begin with. Um, but I like to say, in my experience with the French, it's, it's kind of like a coconut. So it's going to be harder to get in to the inner circle at the off onset. But once you're in, very much loyal, um, very much long-term relationships are super valued. Um, and while in Japan, it's a very polite culture. Um, so you do want to be re very respectful, um, especially of age and hierarchy when dealing with Japanese. Um, and also when, when meeting someone for the first time, it is often customary to give a gift, just as a sign of, of warmness and respect. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's what I have for Kiss, Bow, and Shake Hands. But additionally, before we move on to the next one, we actually want to do a raffle. We're raffling, raffling off a copy of the book. So <laughs> did everybody put their raffle ticket in the, the thing already? OK. OK. One more. OK, perfect. Yeah, do you keep your half? OK. So you'll keep one half? Oh, you put yours? Oh, did you put your name on it? No? OK. OK. Well, you can help me pick then. <laughs> OK, so Dana here is going to help me pick. 
Anybody else? Yeah. Good? Yes. Turn it a little bit here, but. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So our winner of Kiss Bell and Shake Hands is number 379378. 379378. Winner. Yeah, winner. Okay, come on up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll get it Hi there. Congratulations. I'll give you this. What's your name? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Obiora. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And we have one more prize as well. So this is actually donated from our store here at the South Bay Association of Realtors. So, Dana, would you like to help us one more time? <laughs> I feel like Dana was. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful, it's her. <laughs> Okay, so our winner of this lovely hat here is number 379377. 377. Woo, okay, coming up. <laughs> congratulations, what's your name? Congratulations, Tracy. Congratulations, Tracy. All right. Awesome. Okay. So we'll continue on now um, with the letter L. L for Lillian. <laughs> right, let's see. Um, we're talk I'm talking about lenders for L. And the first thing to know, you know, like anything global, is how um, foreign nationals view loans. Perception of loans vary from country to country, obviously. For example, in Brazil, they have super high rates. So when they see our rates, they actually think, even when we think it's high, they think it's super low. Um, and Melissa and I are talking about this, and conversely, in Taiwan, they tend to have very low interest rates. Um, and so I know, like, when I talk to my mom, she's like, oh, 3%, so high, so high. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, when you're talking about anything global, I think it's always be mindful of the perspective you come from. Um, but to talk about loans, just to name a few countries that are more difficult for foreign nationals to purchase real estate. Some of these countries require citizenship. Um, permission from local authorities, marriages, um, work permits, and that includes you're in Europe, it's Austria, Hungary, Denmark, Poland and Finland, in the Middle East, countries like Turkey, Cyprus, Slovenia, Greece, uh, Serbia, and in Asia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, Japan, or not Japan, Korea, um, and Australia and New Zealand apparently are, are more difficult. And then for countries that are easier in the US to purchase, I found a list um, by Dolce Casa just as of June 2023, the most popular countries that Americans are looking at real estate abroad is not surprisingly Italy, Costa Rica, Mexico, Portugal, uh, Portugal, Portugal, Maeve, um, Jamaica, <laughs> Spain, Bahamas, Greece, and the list goes on. Um, but talking about inbound global real estate business here in the uh, United States, you probably know most people finance a purchase here um, and because they have credit history here. And we just wanted to mention that um, I think a lot of foreigners come thinking that I don't know, I think a lot of foreigners may come thinking they can get a loan or can't get a loan. Um, I, I wanna say the cultures I deal with, they think it's, everything's all cash, right? And they think, I don't wanna loan, I don't wanna pay interest rates, but in reality, they're actually loan options for them too. So um, I was just like, for someone from China who has a million dollars cash, instead of just buying a million dollar property, they could put that as a down for something else. Um, I'm obviously not a lender. I think we have a plethora of lenders here today for you guys to talk to mm -hmm. about that. I feel kind of weird talking about this topic in front of you guys. <laughs> Um, but the last thing I will lead on is, um, or the last thing I will add is just with the lenders. I know a few years ago I started as a new agent, and when I started, lenders were honestly one of the biggest partners I partnered up with. Um, shout out to Carly over there. She talked to me when I was a complete nobody. Um, and really learning how to do the business, and um, you know, we would have these like marketing sessions and how to market to different um, populate or different demographics and different clients. And so I think that would be the same for global. So, M is for multiple databases. Brokerages like Sotheby's International, Remax Global, Angers and Volker um, have access to global properties right in their own in-house website. But did you know you, as a member of the South Bay Board of Realtors, also have um, two multilingual websites for free 
right here in your own MLS. We haven't had any trainings recently, but we have one product called Proxio. Proxio is um, an international MLS. It's a referral network platform which shares listings and news of, uh, with our social media channels and creates marketing materials in 18 languages that are already translated for you um, for both our local and international clients. With Proxio, you can expand your web presence to a pool of prospective buyers and to network with other agents and communities and associations worldwide. I will let you know, I had to do some real digging to find out what's going on with it. It's been pretty inactive. And it is not an Engels and Volker um, database and website, trust me, but it's a beginning and it's free and it's an opportunity. And by preparing for our uh, event today, I learned that Maeve actually has used it to put one of her listings in Portugal. She's killing it in this market and in Europe. So, you know, we've got options that we just haven't explored. And, um, and it's kind of cool, I think, that you get to know about some of these things that are, that are free and they're already there for you. The other cool thing that just happened this last year is um, we've expanded our outreach by partnering with um, the Omni MLS, Mexico's first nationwide MLS. And my broker has actually um, been part of uh, working with the first um, Mexican Board of Realtors about 10 or 12 years ago. So in Mexico, they're making a huge effort to kind of organize the data like they are in Europe. And um, these are baby steps because it takes a long time to build these organizations. This is the first time this has happened. And we're also learning how to you know, turn on our, our screens and, and you know, do Zoom meetings. So um, this, um, with 100,000 um, California real estate pros, we can now connect with Omni's 100,000 agents and brokers in Mexico. Omni is focused on providing a united and reliable listing database with accurate sales comps, market analysis, and lead listing data for our um, real estate transactions. Their MLS is in English as well as Spanish. And um, it's, it's a reciprocal. We can make referrals um, um, with these cross-the-border transactions. But it isn't, it, it isn't like we can do a typical transaction. It is different. So you have to really fully communicate. But we can't go over the border anymore and do business we need to start using the, this platform. So um, I hope this is something I did not even know this existed until I was doing the research on Proxio. And, and I haven't taken uh, one of our MLS trainings lately. So I think um, let's, let's help them out wherever we can and, and start communicating with our, our neighbors and take Spanish, which I'm also doing right now. So thank you. <laughs> All right, next we have N NAR Global. Oh yeah, you're gonna be stuck with me again. Um, let's see, oh, now we're gonna get this organized. Okay, NAR Global. Actually, um, it's interesting because um, some of this is like kind of like cross-referencing, but a lot of what um, Claudia mentioned earlier about uh, NAR Global um, is um, that it, they've created this organization within the NAR organization to get us to, to leave home and, and go out and find the world. So the CIPS uh, designation, the ambassador program she mentioned, and um, a, recent, uh, a recent addition uh, is a, um, that NAR Global, specifically the commercial um, part of it, has decided to actually create a pavilion at a, um, a, uh, a trade, um, a trade. Um, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna space on this. On a trade event that happens once a year in Con during the month of May, it's called MIPM, and what it does, it brings, uh, it's the largest uh, worldwide um, property trade show in the world, and um, people come and meet in Con for about four days, and share information about their properties and their projects and whatever. Now we have a new car CEO um, that um, just started with us about two years ago, and he is really embracing and is a global realtor. 
So actually this year in March, he and our current president of CAR um, televised from MIPIM. And um, that was a first. He shared kind of what they're talking about over there, and that's kind of the cool part about this event where you're, you're finding out what are they doing, what, what are they dealing with. Like we're dealing with fires and all the stuff going here in California. They're dealing with the same stuff in different ways. But one of the um, main focuses was uh, transforming commercial buildings and working on their carbon footprint and, and, and sustainable measures. So we're all kind of in this together. And um, it seems like a really cool opportunity that is open to us since there is a pavilion there. You can go on to Nord Global and you can research that as well as the credential and the ambassador programs. And I highly recommend you do it. So let's forget France and think about something that's going on a little closer here in the next uh, few months, and that's going to be in November. NAR is going to be in Anaheim, and they're also going to have a global pavilion that's going to be open for those same people. Some of them are going to come and they're share their information about their properties or the work they're doing in India or, or the, the Philippines or China or whatever. <coughs> So that, well, that is open to you as well. And again, I highly recommend you go to the NAR website and check on that date and um, see if you, there's something that kind of sparked an interest in you today. So thank you. That's it. All right. I'm on. I get my first topic. <coughs> Everybody hear me OK? Yeah. All right. <coughs> Finally. I die in here. Um, so, but uh, I'm going to talk about outgoing and incoming global opportunities. It's very broad. There's a lot of opportunities, a lot of different types of opportunities. Um, what I want to talk about, I'm going to talk, one of my other topics is referrals. I think that's one of the big opportunities of, of incoming and outgoing. Um, so what I want to talk about those, you know, just kind of general different ways you can tap into some of those opportunities, what some of them may be. And even though this is global, a little bit about how you can use some of that within the, the US as well. So we know NAR does their report that talks about you know, where international buyers are, are coming from. Um, in California, obviously, we get a lot of buyers from China. And we get a lot from Canada. Those are two big focuses. <clears throat> just on another level, just a, an extra tip, uh, websites that I've used even for within the US, uh, census.gov and uh, how money walks, if you just Google that. It'll tell you uh, where people are moving in and out of uh, your county. So you can see where people are moving out to. Um, it's how money walks is one of them. Um, and census.gov, you just type in the migration map and they'll give you that. Um, and that, that'll give you really good information. Uh, people moving, it's moving in. They're coming from mostly New York, Chicago, and the Bay Area. Moving out, it's surprising even though we hear everybody moving out of California, yeah. four of the top five sources are within Southern California, other counties. And the fifth one is Vegas. So um, even though we're hearing about Arizona and Texas and everything else. Um, so uh, <coughs> the referrals and global opportunities, it's a good way to expand You know, if you uh, work agent to agent referrals. It's something you can promote to your clients. Tell them, you know, I know agents that create a map about where they know other agents and where they have connections. Promote that on your social media. Tell people about that. Um, some agents, Maeve isn't on the screen right now, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, that's a big part of her business. She, just, she knows lots of agents all over, and she just connects people, and she promotes it. So there are agents where it's all their business or a big portion of it. Um, obviously, uh, incoming opportunities, the U.S. is really popular for uh, international investing and, and international clients. Um, so if you want to figure out what to tap into, obviously you want to think about what countries do you have an interest in, uh, what countries uh, are either you're from or you have connections to or, or languages you speak or you're learning Spanish, what languages you want to learn. I know you're learning Portuguese, so if you want to tap into something, that's a, that's a great place to start. So that's what I have for now on incoming opportunities and outgoing. So we have P for Portugal, Maeve. The P is for Portugal, and it seems that the secret is out. Sleepy little Portugal, um, a country that's not much bigger than Southern California, has been getting so much media attention over the last 
five years or so, um, continually topping the lists for the best country in Europe to retire, safest country in Europe, some of the most affordable real estate in Western Europe, the low outside of Lisbon, <laughs> the lowest cost of living in Western Europe, and recently topped the list for the best country for LGBTQ travel in Europe. Um, and I'd like to add to that the friendliest people in Europe and probably the best weather in Europe, just like California. Uh, so my husband and I moved to Portugal two and a half years ago. And as I was born in Ireland and already had an EU passport, we didn't need to get a visa to come here. We just had to show up. Um, but if you don't have an EU passport, most Americans will need a visa to come and work or live in Portugal. So I thought it might be um, useful for you to know what the three main visas that Californians take advantage of. There are others, but these are the three most common ones. First one, which is brand new, is the digital nomad visa. So in a world when so many people are now working remotely, you can get a visa to work in Portugal for up to a year, as long as you can show that you have proof of employment from outside of Portugal, that you have sufficient income. Um, they're looking that you have income about $3,050 a month or more that you're making out of the country. Um, in order to qualify and um, it's valid for a year. Family members can come with you. Um, hugely popular at the moment. Um, the second one, the D7 visa, this is the passive income visa. This is the one that was traditionally used by retirees that were coming, but now we're seeing more and more younger couples who work remotely who are using this as the visa to come and live long term in Portugal. Um, it does require that you stay in Portugal for six months of the year um, and your income can come from real estate investments, social security, pension, remote jobs, um, intellectual property, owning your own business or other investments. There's a, there's a wide range and it can be a pathway to residency and citizenship down the road if you want it to. And the third one, um, the golden visa, which got a lot of media attention, They've changed the requirements for that this year, so you can no longer buy private real estate in Portugal to qualify for this visa. Um, but large fund, um, real estate fund investments are still, still allowed. The main benefit to the golden visa is that you don't actually have to come and live in Portugal. So this is a visa that you, allows you to get an EU passport without actually living here, um, which has been popular with a lot of investors and a lot of people who just want another option of another passport to carry. Um, so those are the three main ones and there are more. Reach out to me if you need to find out more. So that's my new home, Portugal. Um, so cue for questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions at the moment for our panel? All right, that's yeah. a quick one. We have a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, right here. Well, it depends. In the larger cities, there are, you know, the highly desirable areas are like, <clears throat> excuse me, like California. They're very expensive and it goes into the, you know, million dollar range. But if you uh, get something in, in the little outskirts or smaller towns, you can get something uh, like 300000 to 800000 just depending whether it's a condo or a, you know, a house house or an apartment building. It, it just depends on the type of object that your client might be looking at. So they have a big variety of price ranges. Like little villages, you can still you know, purchase, you know, with little money down. Like a lot of them will do all cash, but you can also, uh, you know, like if you have a letter of credit, they have something similar to like credit check and where you can get a loan for international purchase. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so I have a question for this channel. Uh, if somebody wants to purchase a property using Coinbase, uh, what's the recommended uh, platform? Uh, I don't 
Well, I think it's similar to Bitcoin where if you just converted the cash and put it into escrow. Is that, is that the question? Uh, no, my question is where, which platform would the coin that come from? I, For large transactions. Coin. Yeah, yeah so, so it's just like Bitcoin. They're all similar. All, all the cryptocurrency or the blockchain currencies would be the same. So it's just a matter, matter of converting them and depositing the funds into the escrow account in California. Right, but let's say if we have Coinbase, where would you park the Coinbase? Coinbase is a platform. Coinbase is actually a that's where, type of platform that's where, you, where you can buy different currencies. It's an offline bank. Well, it's, a, no. it's like a bank in itself, but it's not regulated. What's the name? Coinbase, like you're talking about. Oh, yeah, I know. I don't. I don't think you would. You would just liquidate. Like, you have Bitcoin in your Coinbase, probably, right? Yeah. So you would liquidate that, and then you would put that fun, those funds in your bank. Yeah. And Is that the you know, question? They had a, they had a special presentation mm. Yeah, they did an NFT. Well, any banks right now are a little bit shaky. <laughs> To a certain <laughs> limit. <clears throat> but that, that's what makes you know cryptocurrency so unique is that you can spend it in different countries without having to go through conversion. And people are buying houses in California using blockchain technology. So that you know, like Piper Morelli, she's a local agent, I think from Redondo or Manhattan. She. Moretti. Moretti. She's done a lot of transactions, so if you want to call her, she's very open and will give you information. She knows a ton about it. Moretti. Well, I was going to say one, one thing I, I noticed. I was going to talk about it a little bit next, but um, you just need to know documentation. Like for being foreigners, there are different taxes. If you don't have certain documentation, then you know, there can be up, uh, who knows what the tax would be. One in Spain is tw almost 25% if you don't have that. So it's just knowing that going into it. Otherwise, you know, it could be delayed for you to get paid if you want to get that in place because you got to get it from the Department of the Treasury and they're not fast and getting any pay for it, so. I, I think Ben's <laughs> going to talk about it, but a lot of countries, when we're buying overseas, you have to have cash. Cash is king. Mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> to answer your question, I think one interesting factoid um, I learned, um, and I haven't done a transaction in Hong Kong, but I heard that, you know how we have inspections, right? We have termite, we have roof. But I heard that in Hong Kong, you can, there's actually a contingency for feng shui. Inspection. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's really right. Yeah. yeah. And it's like it's part of the it's so it's such a part of the culture that it's as important as if your foundation is terrible. So. Yeah. Sorry. What did you say? What inspections? 
Feng shui. Um, feng shui is basically the yeah. Feng shui. Go into go into to Proxio, set up an account, and I think you can, you know, um, you know, search on on Portugal and see what comes up. I haven't used it lately, um, but that's what I would do. Or again, we could we could request a training. I, I think we should have one just to introduce. Right. To be a real exactly. How do we know they are good? Just mm. know, like, you know, right. system to like really That's more common in yeah. other countries than not. I know. Yeah. It's scary to even like, you know, connecting someone right. to the other side of the world when you don't know what is their relationship. Sometimes well, what's maybe important or, <clears throat> or helpful to you is also if you check on the CIPS network. Yes. Um, there are, and if you find an agent that might have knowledge about Taiwan or get in touch with that agent who can then maybe guide you in the right direction because they probably have a connection somehow over there, yeah. that might be a way to go. Mm -hmm. can, I, yeah. can I share something? Um, it, it all goes back to education, and that's why our National Association of Realtors are uh, select, dedicated, uh, knowledgeable people that go and are the global ambassadors that go sign the MOUs and bilateral partnerships with other countries. This way we are able to connect with those realtors that actually have taken the code of ethics and represent our realtor brand. Mara, this is a great reason for you to get CIPS because yeah. Yeah. the agents that get a certification aren't just from the U.S., they're also from overseas. And you, a lot of times you can go get your CIPS certificate in another country. So they've been kind of vetted a little bit. You know, at least they're kind of ethical. They want to learn about it. They have that network. And you can find them on the CIPS. There's almost, every country has at least one agent. Like even if you go to Panama, there's six or seven CIPS people. 
that you can look at and you know vet and check out their background. But yeah. you know every every country has a risk, right? Yeah. Well, and they, ha and they have to do a certain pr amount of production to get it as well. It was a really great question, and it actually leads into our next uh, slide, which has been yes, R for referrals. Yes, leads into <laughs> referrals. We basically covered everything I was going to talk about, so <laughs> we are good. <coughs> um, no, so I mentioned it a little bit earlier in the incoming and outgoing opportunities. Uh, it's, it could be uh, your sole source of business. Some agents, it is a specific source of business, just like farming or working expireds or whatever it is, agent to agent referrals is a source of business if you work it and you treat it that way and international and global referrals are the same way uh, like i mentioned earlier if there's specific places that you're connected to um but how to uh, i'm going to touch on a few things like how to make those connections uh, and it's another thing we talked about a little bit but agents that i know that are doing it whether it's you know, within the u.s or around the world when they're traveling they're going to stop in to those different shops and locations and meet people. Um, I know they'll go as far as they'll contact those offices and see when they're doing their, their sales meetings, maybe for the week or the month. And they'll go in and they'll present about where they're from or they'll just go and network and, and meet the agents that are there. So it's, it's being intentional about it if that's really what, what you want to do and get business from it. And, and if you have a plan and you, and you put that in place, you know, it'll work. Um, even if you're not traveling, you're going there, if there are other areas that you want to focus on, um, you can Zoom. You know, if they're doing meetings, uh, you, a lot of them may be already doing it on Zoom, or maybe you can, they, you know, they can put you up on the screen and you can join their meeting by Zoom that way and that way. You can at least get your info there, make connections. Um, go, oh, we mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, conferences conventions, trade shows, go get your CIPS, all those different things go. And the more connections you make, it's just like doing business with buyers or sellers. The more, the more people you talk to and connections you make, the more you're going to get from it. Um, and you got to work it really like you would work a farm or, or work a, a database of people you know. You know, add them to a CRM, categorize them, send them email updates, uh, market updates so they know what's going on in the market, what type of properties we have what investment opportunities there are, um, updates on you know, immigration law and all these things that might apply to, to people that are global. Um, connect with them on social media, it's huge. And then uh, last point is give and you shall receive. Uh, we did a referral, we just sent one, we've done two within the last couple weeks. One, one closed in Italy and then we sent one to Spain and they said, oh, we know someone selling a home in Los Angeles. Here, we'll refer that back to you. And now we have a listing in Los Angeles because we just reached out. Um, and that's the other thing, be specific. Well, not specific, actually. Be a little bit broad about where you are because if you tell people in Italy that you're in Torrance, they may not know where that is. <laughs> <coughs> like, great, that's in the US somewhere. Okay, when I hear someone say Torrance, say, you know, it's Los Angeles, Southern California, whatever it is. And if you know, it's not an area you work, then you just, you probably know someone you can, you're not going to get a referral fee out of it, but you can say, okay, you know, be nice to someone else you know in San Diego or Orange County or something. Um, and then I mentioned earlier the, the documentation, just be aware of the, what documentation is going to take, because one that we just dealt with in Spain, if you didn't have the proper paperwork, you're going to pay a 24% uh, tax on it, I think. So they'll take that right out of your commission, your referral fee. So that's it for now on referrals. Thank you, Ben. Okay. All right, so I have S for stats or statistics. Um, so very interesting, according to NAR, the top five foreign buyers that are purchasing in the United States are Canada, Mexico, China, India, and Brazil. Um, in terms of states, Florida still is number one in terms of where foreign buyers like to purchase, but California is number two. So about 47% of those foreign buyers come from Asia, um, specifically from China and from India. So California is definitely a very popular place for foreign buyers to invest in. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, and then the next one is um, trade missions. So T for trade missions. So trade missions are a really great way um, 
to explore international business opportunities. They are a chance to meet developers, investors, and other real estate professionals in other countries. They're usually combined with uh, unique cultural experiences that also make the trips memorable and fun, and of course, those really, really great business connections. Um, if you're interested in learning more about trade missions, there are some really great sites to refer to, um, one being FIOPSI, another one being ARIA Global, um, and also trade.gov slash trade missions. Um, that one's a little bit more oriented for business in general, but they have real estate specific ones included in there. Um, as Susan mentioned as well, um, there are also global real estate conferences that occur all over the world. A MIPIN is a huge one that occurs in March um, in France. There are, um, there's a summit Imobiliario in Brazil, so that happens in September, um, and then uh, Latin America GRI Real Estate, which normally happens in May in New York. So those are really good ones to look up if you're interested in trade shows, trade missions. Thank you. All right. Okay, I'm gonna talk about Uruguay. Um, it's a little unique. Uh, to talk about, but it, I picked it because it's a, it's a special interest of mine. I, I took a six-week six trip uh, about 12 years ago to Central and South America, and I looked at different uh, real estate opportunities. And Uruguay jumped out, and that was, that was my favorite. So I wanted to talk a little bit about it. It's real, it was very interesting to me. So I just wanted to pass along some of the information that, that I got from being there, and obviously that was 12 years ago. It's changed uh, quite a bit. Um, so I got some information to pass along that way. So Uruguay, uh, Spanish speaking, uh, there's about 3.4 million uh, residents. Um, it's uh, oh, so located, it's between the, on the southern end of Brazil, next to Argentina, all, along the coast, um, South America. And foreign ownership, uh, it's very liberal, so there is foreign ownership opportunity. Um, Non-residents can purchase and own on equal terms as locals. So there's no restrictions on that. Different types of properties. There's a lot of different types. When I was there, I visited Montevideo, which is very urban, uh, very dense population, um, and Punta del Este. Those were the two, two places, and Punta del Este, is, uh, that was my favorite of all of it. Um, it's on the beach, and it's about 7,000 people in the off-season. Uh, you know, I was there in our summer, which is their winter. There's not very many people there, but it goes up to about 200,000 uh, in their, winter, their summer, which is our winter. Basically, they take the last week of December off and all of January, and they basically go there and vacation, which is pretty nice. Maybe that was what attracted me to it. I don't know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it's like the French Riviera of, of South America. So, um, and the people, people are amazing. Very nice. So those are, and there's, you'll find a lot of rural properties as well. Um, all, print, all transactions are registered, so there's public registry of everything. Um, notary public, like you mentioned, it's a very vital part of the transaction. Um, there are agents. You do have to be licensed, so that is, that's a good thing there. Um, there's property taxes, which be, uh, it varies based on the property type or the location. Um, and then due diligence, you do have a normal due diligence period, very similar to what we have here for ownership, you know, history, liens, encumbrances, things like that. So you have your time to check everything out. And there is financing, which is different than when I was there. Um, and I, in 12 years, the prices have skyrocketed, really. Um, and a, a big part of that is probably because they brought financing in. And you have that ability now, which you didn't when I was there. Um, and then I pulled just some examples of properties um, in Montevideo. You can, in the city, there's a, a condo for $4 million as much. You know, Lakeview, really nice. Um, all the way down to you know, in another condo in the 500,000 range. So it's a big range, um, Punta del Este, uh, a mansion on the beach. Uh, these are all listings that we have. We have offices in both, both locations. Uh, $20 million listing in um, Punta del Este on the beach, and then as little as a $500,000 condo, which when I was there, that, was, that condo was probably 70 or 80,000. Um, so whoever bought there, then did well. <laughs> um, that's what I, I got for Uruguay. Punta del Este, that almost sounds like cussing in Spanish. <laughs> right. um, so we covered South America and Europe and 
Germany and Portugal and Japan. So I'm going to cover Southeast Asia. I'm talking about Vietnam a little bit. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to Vietnam last September. And Vietnam's a very strict country. They recently opened up and they were very reluctant with COVID. In fact, we didn't know we were going to get our visa until maybe three weeks before. But they're fully open now. And Vietnam's a strict country. You know, of course, it's communist, right? We spent the 60s and 70s fighting that. But when you get to Vietnam, it feels very capitalistic. There's a lot of hustle and bustle going on. And you can buy anything. There's a lot of privately run stores. There's a lot of activity on the streets, you know, people selling food. Um, and if you actually look at like California, LA City, if you're, if you're familiar with the just cause ordinance, the eviction moratorium we just had, the fact that you can't raise rents, you kind of wonder which country is communist and which isn't. Just a little political point. But um, being that it's communist is very safe. And the country is, it's, it's, it's literally run by the government. They set the policy for the country. You can't, foreigners can't own property in Vietnam, but supposedly if you have cash, you can buy it. You know, there's always a way around stuff. Um, a lot of uh, foreigners going to Vietnam to retire because it's very affordable. It's very cheap. People are very friendly and it's a, it, geographically, it's a beautiful country. And the coastline is about a thousand miles, which is similar to um, California. And it's surrounded by China to the north and uh, Laos to the central area and Cambodia to the south and Vietnam or Thailand is just a hop, skip and a jump from Cambodia. Um, the, all the countries are very similar, but if you look at like Thailand, they're a very Buddhist country. Vietnam doesn't really have a lot of religion because, probably because of you know, the, the communism for so many years. But people are very friendly. Um, it's known for their beaches, their pagodas, the mountains. Um, it's very desirable for a lot of, you know, British and French and Germans go there to retire in the, the coastal com uh, communities. Vietnam continues to be a, a magnet for attracting foreign investment. They have um, had very strong e economic growth and they have a lot of upside to their GDP. Um, and it's a, re it's, it's a relatively stable government if you compare it to what it was you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Vietnam is one of the fastest growing economies in the world with many positive indices. There are many compelling reasons why it is a good country to look at for investment opportunities. With a population of 96 million, Vietnam has more people than Germany, France, or the UK. And the population is relatively young. So I think um, Lillian mentioned that Japan has an aging population. Well, the average age in Japan is 47 years old and in Vietnam it's 30, compared to the EU, which is about 43. So there's a lot of people that are capable of working and English is starting to become uh, taught in the schools, so people speak English fairly well. Um, Vietnam has been on a steady, long, positive economic run. The country is considered a frontier market because of its relatively, it's relatively early as an investment market. This is great news for risk-tolerant investors who, have, who believe in the country and its potential. You know, a lot of American companies are starting to produce goods in Vietnam and, you know, import into the United States. Some strategic advantages of Vietnam, has, it has an overall good medical care and high standards of education attainment, which is compatible with Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, and outpaces countries like <coughs> India, Brazil, and Mexico. Um, any questions about Vietnam? What's that? Oh, you know, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, it's hard for foreign investors to buy there because it's considered a collective, so the government kind of owns most of the properties. So if you're going to relocate, it's mo most like the foreigners' rent. But rent's very affordable. Like when we were driving around, they're very high tech. We would do Airbnb, like on the way to a, a place, 23 bucks a night for a studio you know, in a high-rise building. A very good service. They would meet you down the lobby. It's a super affordable country. I don't think you can do that yet in Vietnam. Even for the foreigners who go there, a lot of times they get a 90-day visa, and then they have to leave the country and come back. Yeah, so they go to like Thailand or Cambodia, or, yeah. That's what they do. 
but very clean, very safe country. All right. Good job. So, W, w W's for um, working remotely. So, as we know, um, COVID issued in a new normal uh, of remote work. And uh, so our remote workers didn't have to go experience traffic jams or dress codes. All we have to do is look professional from the waist up and <laughs> comfy waist down. You know, there's been a big uh, uptick in uh, sales in pajamas. Um, in 2020, many, worker, many workers actually fled cities uh, for cheaper places and um, to get closer, really, to nature, in a way, if you think about it. Costly cities lost workers to scenic spots since 2020. Vacation homes um, became hot as they get both work and play, um, especially like we can look at what's going on in San Francisco now. Downtown San Francisco is devastated. It's shocking to hear what's happened to that incredible city. But <laughs> the workers are a lot healthier <coughs> because it, they're, just, they're just not dealing with this civilization that we have created and it's out of control. And especially the tech industry, because I was part of the tech industry and I put in those long, those long weeks and hours. It's, it's not healthy. It really isn't. So some workers um, chose to move, you know, out of the city in rural areas and, you know, check in with their office and, and are doing work. While other workers, which we've already heard a lot about today, um, headed abroad to some of the more stunning places to live. Um, and so here's some of the, in every list I like, there's a couple of lists, but this is the one, it was 2023. But some of the top rated destinations that rank the highest based for um, on the internet, um, the, the criteria was uh, internet reliability, life quality, beauty, which is just as important, um, safety, affordability, incentives, and openness. And I think that's openness in, in community. So the best ones were Toronto, Canada, Madrid, Spain, Auckland, New Zealand, Madeira, Portugal, Helsinki, Finland, I'm going to kill this, Svalbard, Norway, Berlin, Germany, Valparaiso, Chile, which is supposed to be gorgeous, I want to go there, Dublin, Ireland, and Sydney, Australia. Remote work has just transformed the way we live and we work in the 21st century. It's brought many benefits for workers and employers, such as better work-life balance, higher productivity, lower costs, and more flexibility. However, it also, pours, it also poses some challenges, such as isolation, which is true. Look at us. I mean, this is one of our first events we've had, and I, I think we're hungry for them. Uh, and, and just the diversity of the food is like, it's, I mean, we're in heaven. Um, uh, communication, technical issues, we're talking about, there's a lot of technical issues. A lot of us have been impacted. Um, with uh, getting things done, like a car repair, and dealing with when's a part coming in, when's a worker going to get off. A car? You know, there's just so many things that are going on in this loss, loss of our culture. So remote work is not a temporary trend. It's probably going to be here to stay, but it's a permanent shift that requires adaptation and innovation from all stakeholders. So I think a lot of stuff was discussed, and we know uh, where what workers and the options that they have, and you know some of us are retiring, and we may consider retiring in some of these countries we discussed today. But I, I do think um, it's an exciting time, and knowing we we have tools and and uh, technologies like a, a plane that can take you to to India to have a, an operation that maybe you couldn't afford, but you can if you go there, and the work is superior because a lot of trained in this country and vice versa. So thank you, and you won't see me again. I'm done for the day. Look into, if we have clients that are working remotely in a different country, what they have to do about the US tax. So that, that would be... Well, as long as you're a US citizen, I think it's over oh, well. 75,000 you get ta international taxation. Yeah. 
you should talk to your CPA and tax <laughs> advisor, and I am not allowed to give tax <laughs> advice. <laughs> but, but, I mean, but you are, you are, you will be taxed on your income internationally as long as you're a U.S. citizen. So, Sabina mentioned uh, Germany, like a lot of people are giving up their U.S. citizenship in return in Germany mm -hmm. because they don't have the tax in the U.S. And there's actually only a few countries that do international taxation. I know Philippines is one of them with the U.S. that will get you wherever you go. All right, so I'm doing exchange X. We have, what, three more letters. Um, so currency exchange is a little bit related to uh, what we were just talking about and cryptocurrency. Um, with currency exchange, you know, normally it takes longer than transferring like cryptocurrency and there's usually a fee involved. So you, you lose a little bit of money when you do the exchange rate mm -hmm. to a different country. Um, currency exchange rates affect foreign and domestic real estate investor, investors. The level of fluctuation can have a big, a huge impact on foreign investors buying in the market. Investors prefer to invest in the foreign currency that is growing. Typically there's an influx of foreign investors in real estate markets where the currency is growing. So like we talked about in Vietnam, you know, you may not be buying property, but you can invest in businesses and, you know, emerging mar markets like in China was, you know, 15 years ago, it was huge growth. People were investing it. This is because the value of foreign currency starts growing competitively to that of other currencies. Foreign investors have more purchasing power and hence can buy property in markets where there is growth. So for example, when you know, like the Spanish currency, I guess they were using the Euro, right? I think on the Euro, but when their currency was declining, people weren't really investing in, in countries. They really go after countries where you, the opportunities are better. So I'll just hit on like four different currency exchange companies that you guys might be familiar with. Um, Money Corp, the Money Corp group serves the growing foreign exchange and payments needs of global businesses, importers and exporters, online sellers, and personal clients. OFX promotes a better way to move money around the world. They have over 1 million customers and operate in 55 different countries, 55 different currencies within 190 countries. Their clients get the best of both worlds, a seamless digital platform combined with 24-7 phone access to currency experts. World Remit, Remit serves 5.7 million customers using 70 different currencies across 130 countries worldwide with various options for sending transfers overseas including bank transfers, mobile money, and cash pickup. 95% of World Remit transfers are ready in minutes. Currency Direct has been making money transfers better since 1996. Their motto is currency and money transfer is our passion. They trade in 40 different currencies and focus on European countries. They have offices in India, South America, Portugal, and all over Europe. Next we have. All right. Bye. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we are at Y, YouTube. It's me. I think you last week, but Ben gets to be last. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, <coughs> Everybody knows YouTube. It still remains to be the number two search engine around the world. Um, and I was going to add, despite being blocked in China, um, for those of you who don't know, when you're in China and you're being blocked off of Google, Gmail, YouTube, and everything, um, a lot of people, and I know all my friends have access, they, still, they can still access, you just have to use a VPN. Um, and most mm -hmm. people, I mean, probably not your average middle, uh, middle class person, um, but most of the people who are probably investing in US probably have access to it. So still a really, really great tool. Um, obviously an awesome tool to preview properties. During COVID, a lot of foreign investors purchased properties uh, sight and seen using these tools. I know for sure, I know for a fact that a lot of my friends overseas could ask me to create a channel um, about just introducing properties out here. Um, but the key to anything, doing anything like that is just consistency. And I personally know I'm not gonna keep it up. Um, but for those of you who you know, want to target different markets out there, it is a really, really good tool. Um, the only thing I'll add is um, ChatGPT is a great tool. Again, I went on there and you know just, tech, uh, just typing in YouTube, um, they actually have all the top channels of 
the local real estate uh, channels on YouTube. So if anyone interested, go on there. And linking back to what this agent was talking about in Thailand, I was actually thinking you could probably do that, like go on YouTube to see which Thailand agents probably talking about Thailand. And then hopefully it's not a scam. No. <laughs> 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 no scams. <laughs> anyway, I was like, maybe you can go like a backwards way to find legit. You know, like, in Thailand, for, for now. <laughs> <laughs> So I was just thinking YouTube, there's probably other ways you can generate leads in other countries. Yeah, you can also use ChatGPT to write a script for you yes. for the video you're going to do on That's YouTube. That's true. <coughs> and it will. Yeah. And it's language. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, good job. All right. So I will finish us up here. You made it all the way to Z. So good job. Staying awake after that food. Um, the, I'm going to finish up with a new program. I don't know if anybody has heard it. I don't know if it's really going to take off or not. Um, Zoom. So obviously it's exploded since the pandemic and it exploded shortly after and then it's tailed off a little bit because people are, you know, they're actually tired of it and a little burnout on Zoom. But obviously it's, it's opened up a lot more opportunities. I meant, talked about opportunities earlier. There's so much we can do with it. A number of the different topics we've talked about today have mentioned it. Um, I wanted to mention some of the things that are obvious and then some other ways that maybe you could be using it that, uh, that you might not be thinking about. So <clears throat> ways to use it, obviously you can do buyer appointments, listing appointments. It doesn't just have to be globally, but nationally anywhere. If someone's just down the street and they're too busy, obviously we, we can use it. And it's, it's used a lot more these days, but it is something where, like I mentioned earlier, Tap into uh, other real estate meetings in offices in other countries. If you have an international client, it's a great way, you know, instead of a conference call, it's a great way to see them face to face and build a little bit more rapport. Um, so those types of appointments, showings, I've used it on showings before when someone, for one, it, it can record it so they can go back and, and look at it again, but not everybody has an iPhone, not everybody has a way to see it. They can get log into Zoom and they can access that way, just get the app on their phone. Strategy sessions, which I call people, uh, sessions where meetings with people that just, they're not sure what to do. It's not buying, it's not selling, it's just trying to figure out what to do with their property. Um, getting to know them, giving webinars. We talked about YouTube, videos, having channels. You can actually do a webinar on buying real estate. You know, it could be buying real estate in the US and you're doing YouTube videos to promote it to people overseas. Or you can, if you have a connection, say to Spain or Portugal, you can do a webinar here for people that are here that might want to buy there. And then you can do a webinar to them to try to, try to get referral business. Um, and then you can also do it to record videos that you can put on YouTube because you can put a nice green screen on the background. It's, it's an easy green screen because it's impossible to get it to work right when you use a real green screen and you have a green halo around you and it just doesn't work right. But Zoom does a really good job and then you, know, you can shorten it, clip it, do whatever you want with the video once you have it. So it's another way of just using Zoom. We actually just a meeting with yourself just to, as a recording and a way to do it without even meeting with anybody else. So those are a few ways, hopefully some maybe you didn't think about that could be helpful. And that is it for Z and A to Z. <laughs> So yeah, we wanted to thank everyone in again um, for attending. We hope that you found it very informative and useful. Um, it is kind of that two o'clock hour, so we want to respect your time. But if you have questions, you can come up to us individually and perhaps ask. Um, and if anyone is interested in joining our committee, come up to me. Let me know. Great. Thank you. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.